So it is for me, Little League Baseball season in the Reigns house. Uh, who has had to deal with Little League Baseball season as a parent before? Anybody? Is it just us? Okay, several of y'all. Is it always terrible? Yeah. Um, so uh, I thought in preseason, as we're going through practice, I thought our team was going to be pretty good. Uh, I was wrong. We have not won a game yet, and the other night we had uh, our third game of the year, and it was the worst game we played all year, which is bad when you've not won a game yet. So, um, yeah, we are, uh, everything's going wrong. We had trouble making throws. We couldn't throw it from second to first, which isn't that far. You'd think that would not be a problem. We couldn't stop balls coming through the infield, but... Our kids were at least on the same mission. They were trying to win a game, and if nothing else, their hope was, well, their coach's hope, because their hope was they're still going to win the game, but their coach's hope was maybe they'll at least get better by the end of this game. They didn't. Um, it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And, you know, like I said, they're all kind of on this same purpose, except for one kid um, who had decided he was going to quit. And no, it wasn't my kid. He didn't play good, but he didn't quit. So a ball gets by the uh, third, ba third baseman into the outfield. Not that big of a deal. He could have made the play, but, you know, it's Little League. The ball gets by him, and the outfielder goes and decides, I'm done. And rather than pick up the ball and throw it into the infield, he decides he's going to kick it. And he kicks the ball. And he kicks the ball. It's not to the end because he's kicking it like two feet. And as he's kicking the ball, one run scores. He kicks it again. Two runs are in. Three runs are in. Four runs are in. The guy gave up a inside the park grand slam just because he was done with playing baseball that night and did not want to throw it in. Maybe the kid plays soccer. I don't know. And he got confused. But it was not a good night for us. We played terrible. It wasn't just him. We gave up 10 runs in three innings, and that's all we got in because we ran out of time. We lost the game 10 to 1. Nine of the runs that we gave up were just because we couldn't throw the ball. Not because they hit it. We just couldn't throw the ball. It was a bad night for all of us on the field. Well, I wasn't on the field, or we would have won, right? It, it was a rough night, but they all had a purpose. They all just weren't engaged in playing in the game. None of them were really engaged in playing in the game. <laughs> kind of looks like last night. Who, how many Tennessee fans we got? Who watched the game last night? That second half, we weren't too engaged, were we? I was listening to sports talk radio this week. I know it's dumb, but people listen to it. And through sports talk radio, there's this one guy on the radio who's saying, if we do this, 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 he comes up with seven things that we've got to do before us. we even have a chance to beat Florida. We didn't accomplish any of that last night. Um, but in the first half, it was, you know, exciting. We're in the game, and I'm like, we have a chance. We might actually pull this out. And notice I'm saying we. I wasn't on the field. I had no influence on this game whatsoever. And in the second half, as it kind of goes sideways, I'm like, you all are terrible. Can you figure out how to catch the ball? I'm putting it on them in the second half. First half, I was part of the team. But hey, anyways, you know, in reality, if you're a sports fan, we're cheerleaders, but we're not really a part of the team. We're really good at cheering them on when things are going well. We're really good at cheering against them and yelling at them when things are going bad. But we're cheerleaders. We're not part of the team. We can't really influence what happens on the field. Sometimes we're just on the field, like we were in our T-ball or Little League game the other night, and we're just not engaged in what's going on on the field. Here's the thing, as we dig in this morning, as we talk about this initiative that we're putting out there called Who's Your One? Sometimes we're really engaged in the faith. And sometimes we're just out there playing, kicking the ball around like we're not even part of the game. Sometimes we're really good at being cheerleaders, but that's not what God called you to be. God never called you to be a cheerleader. God called you to be a champion for Jesus. 
We can cheer him on all we want, but if we're not part of the mission, we're not living out the calling that he has given us in our lives. We get involved on the surface sometimes. You know, we show up to church, we're in a life group, we, we get some, some sense of involvement, but sometimes we don't really offer any effort towards the mission. Sometimes it, all it is is we show up to church or we show up to a life group or, or hey, we're, we're doing a Thanksgiving thing, so I'll show up and serve that day, but that's really it. We don't put in a lot of effort. We're really good at cheering on those that do and saying, hey, you all go share the mission. You share the gospel this week. Yay, go do your job. He called us to get out of the stands and get into the game. He has not called us to sit on the sidelines and just cheer on people who are in the church doing the mission. He called you to be on the team engaged in the mission. And it starts with one. Our passage today, we're going to focus in Luke chapter 5. Scripture will be on the screen, but you can open up there if you would like. Beginning in verse 17 of Luke 5. One day, while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took, took off some of the tiles and they lowered the sick man on his, mat, on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, Young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law said to themselves, Who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up or to say stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And immediately, as everyone watched the man, jumped up, picked up his mat, and went home, praising God, everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe. And they praised God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. This story takes place towards the beginning of Jesus' adult earthly ministry. And He's constantly having these interactions with the religious leaders, with the Pharisees, with these people who were supposed to know what it meant to follow God. And his message was often, very often, almost always confrontational to where they stood on things. They had some obvious differences in the way that they looked at the religious law and what it meant to follow the Lord. And these religious people, these Pharisees, they had put this unnecessary burden on the people. And Jesus comes along and he says, that is nonsense. You're forcing them to follow laws that you can't even follow. And he says, this is the true way to salvation. He is the true way to salvation. And and he makes them mad. And, And you notice what they say. Who is this guy? Who does he think he is? He he can't go and do and forgive sins like he says he's doing. This is a a question in Scripture that comes up a lot. Who is this guy? Who does he think he is? Why does he say he can forgive sins? Only God can do that. Who is this man? It's a question that all of us have to wrestle with. Who is this Jesus? When we look at life and we... We hear of how Jesus can be the Lord of our life. Who is he really to us? Who is Jesus to you? Have you wrestled with that question? And when we figure out who he is to us, 
what do we do with that? When we figure out who Jesus really is, we have to decide, all right, how are we going to respond to this? Jesus here is kind of funny. He always kind of responds funny to me because he, he was just blunt. He could read their mind. He knew exactly what they were thinking. He does a Jedi mind trick. Who is this man who you think that I am? He challenges them. Then he shows them who he is. And this guy who they, his friends have brought him before Jesus because he can't walk, he heals him. And it says they are amazed. It says they are filled with awe. And it says they glorified God because of what they had just witnessed. This group of men who brings the, his, their friend to Jesus, they already had an inkling that Jesus was a special guy. They had likely heard stories of who this guy was. He, he was just beginning in his ministry, but he had already started to do some things that, that were turning heads. So they bring their paralyzed friend to him. And there are some things that we can take from how they handled this situation and to how we should live our lives. The, the first thing you notice, they had a mission. They, they didn't just go out all willy-nilly trying to hopefully get their friend healed, or maybe something's going to happen. They went with a specific mission in mind. All of us have a mission. Mission drives who we are and what we do. Mission defines us. Even if we haven't defined our mission, you have a mission. Most of your workplaces probably have a mission statement. Whose job has a mission statement? Few of you. So if you don't stick to the mission statement... If you kind of start to veer off path, then your supervisor will say, hey, you're getting off track here and get you back on track for the mission statement. Who's got an Instagram account? Most of you and the rest of you just won't admit it, right? Instagram's mission statement is to capture and share the world's moments. Most of you probably did it this week. You fulfilled their mission statement because you took a picture of something that was going on in your life and shared it out there for people to see. All because we need the, the like, right? Some of you, maybe you're even all-star Christians. My family is not this, but maybe you got a mission statement for your family. You had Chip and Joanna come in and put a shiplap wall up. You had somebody come in and paint it on the wall, and this is your mission statement for your family, and, and you share it with your family every day. Our mission statement at my house is, let's get out of the house, get to school today without anyone getting hurt or anyone getting yelled at. That is our goal every single day. Our mission statement at Northview Church, we share it often, making disciples who are growing in their love for Jesus and people. Whether in work in your family, or as you're a part of this church, there's a mission that we are all on. And when we veer from that mission, we are no longer doing what we were created to do. God has given you a mission with your life. He has called you to be a champion for the gospel in your life. The mission drives the essentials and the basics of everything that we do. Even Jesus had a mission statement. He doesn't put it out there as this is a mission statement, but he did in Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. What was the defining drive for Jesus in this passage? Or for, his, for these men in this passage? They had to get their friend to Jesus. Their defining drive was just get him in front of this guy. And maybe if we get him to Jesus, maybe if we get him in front of this guy who we've heard so much about, maybe Jesus will do something. And maybe he'll be able to walk again. Their mission was to see their friend walk. 
to see their friend healed. What drives you? What's your mission? In your daily life, what drives you? We have all the typical things that most people will say, my career drives me, my education drives me. Maybe your family drives you, or maybe it's achievements that drive us. All of those are great things. Maybe God desires those things for you. But what drives you spiritually? In your relationship with the Lord, what drives you? To be a part of some great movement of God? To be a part of seeing maybe your kids get saved? Whatever it is, it's what you're working toward. Whatever your spiritual mission is, is what your daily goal is in your relationship with God. What drives you? Like really drives you. Not what you say drives you. But when you think about your life and your relationship with God, what really drives you? Do you have kingdom-sized dreams? Or are you satisfied with what happens in this life? Are you longing for more? Or are you satisfied with the moment? What drives you? These men... They had a mission. Their drive, get their friend to Jesus. No matter what it took, get their friend to Jesus because the second thing we see is they had an expectation. They knew Jesus would do something. Maybe they didn't know what was going to happen, but they knew He was going to do something. So they take a risk to get their friend there. I mean, this guy couldn't walk and they didn't exactly have, you know, wheelchairs or things to get him around. They had to carry him there to get their friend there. They had to get him on the roof. For us, we're on the other side of the cross. We know who Jesus is. We know what he can accomplish in lives. They didn't. Jesus had not went to the cross yet. They were going on faith that this guy could do something. How much more should we live in expectation? If they could expect Jesus to accomplish this, not knowing about the cross, how much more should we live in expectation of, of His miracles, of His work in our lives because we've seen the work on the cross? We've experienced, hopefully all of you in this room, has experienced His divine healing of your soul in your life. They had an expectation. Do you have an expectation of anyone in your life coming to faith because of you? Do you expect that someone you know who is struggling with their faith or is just not a believer at all can come to faith because of you? Because of Jesus working through your life. And if you do, what are you doing about it? Does it move you to action at all? Because these guys, they expected Jesus to come through and it moved them to action. They didn't just sit and wait. They went and did something. But they faced an obstacle. It's not easy to go about the mission. Things pop up that distract us from the mission. Things pop up that we've got to get through to be able to make it on the mission. These guys, they faced an obstacle. The crowd was too big. How are they going to get to Jesus? They can't even see Him. Our goal, get our friend to Jesus. We can't even get in the house. Most of us at this point, we give up. We wave the white flag. Or we say... All right, I'll just come back later. Maybe Jesus will have some time to talk to me. That's how most of us would have responded. These guys busted through the roof. 
They didn't let anything stop them. They climb up on the roof with their disabled, paralyzed friend, drag him up there and bust a hole in the roof so that he can meet Jesus. We face obstacles right now. We've been in a pandemic for a year and a half, which has caused all kinds of obstacles for us. We had to shut down church for three or four months last year because there was so much unknown of what was going on. It's kind of scary sometimes when you think about it. But we can't hold up and keep to ourselves when we have such an important mission. We've got to bust through the roof. We've got to figure out how do we take this gospel, the mission He has given us, and bust through whatever's going on in life and make sure people hear it. Is your hope and your faith strong enough to bust through the roof? Do you really trust that He is going to come through? Here's what happened when these men refused to let an obstacle derail them. They get more than they ever bargained for. They just took him so he could walk again. That was it. I mean, that's a big thing. But that was their only purpose. But we shouldn't settle for the mundane. We shouldn't settle with being able to walk again when Jesus wants the miraculous. People thought that the primary need, these guys thought his primary need was external. He needs to walk. That's his whole need. But what Jesus did in this passage is true for everyone. He shows them his need isn't to walk His need is the internal posture of a heart that needs to be changed. Walking is secondary. His physical disability is all secondary. Jesus focuses on his heart. I firmly believe that God has placed this church this group of believers in this place at this time in this darkness we see going on in our world because Jesus wants us to expect a miracle. Jesus wants us to expect Him to come through with us on mission. He doesn't just want us sitting back. He hasn't called us to be cheerleaders. He's called us to be champions of the gospel. He's called us to go and to fish. It's a story. I've shared this story before. Daryl Robinson wrote in a book called People Sharing Jesus. Now it came to pass that a group existed who called themselves fishermen. And lo, there were many fish in the waters all around. In fact, the whole area was surrounded by streams and lakes filled with fish, and the fish were hungry. Week after week, month after month, and year after year, these who called themselves fishermen met in meetings and talked about their call to go fish the abundance of fish, and how they might go about fishing. Year after year, they carefully defined what fishing means. They defended fishing as an occupation and declared that fishing is always to be a primary task of fishermen. Continually, they searched for new and better methods of fishing. And for new and better definitions of fishing, they created witty slogans and displayed them on big, beautiful banners. These fishermen built large, beautiful buildings called fishing headquarters. The plea was that everyone should be a fisherman and every fisherman should fish. One thing they didn't do, however, they did not fish. 
In addition to meeting regularly, they organized a board to send out fishermen to other places where there were many fish. The board hired staffs and appointed committees and held many meetings to define fishing, to defend fishing, and to decide what new streams should be thought about. But the staff and committee members did not fish. Large, elaborate, and expensive training centers were built whose original and primary purpose was to teach fishermen how to fish. Over the years, courses were offered on the needs of fish, the nature of fish, where to find fish, the psychological reactions of fish, and how to approach and feed fish. Those who taught had doctorates in fishology, but the teachers did not fish. They only taught fishing. Year after year, after tedious training, many graduated and were given fishing license. They were sent to do full-time fishing, some to distant waters, which were filled with fish. Many who felt the call to be fishermen responded. They were commissioned and sent to fish, but like the fishermen back home, they never fished. They engaged in all kinds of other occupations. Some felt their job was to relate to the fish in a good way so the fish would, not, would know the difference between good and bad fishermen. Others felt that simply letting the fish know they were nice, land-loving neighbors, and how loving and kind they were was enough. Now it's true that many of the fishermen sacrificed and put up with all kinds of difficulties. Some lived near the water and bore the smell of dead fish every day. They received the ridicule of some who made fun of their fishermen's clubs and the fact that they claimed to be fishermen, yet they never fished. Imagine how hurt some were when one day a person suggested that those who don't fish were not really fishermen, no matter how much they claimed to be. Yet it didn't sound correct. Is a person a fisherman if year after year he never fishes? More plainly stated, is one really following if he isn't fishing? I don't know what the future holds for the world. It's a, it's a crazy time. But I know we are called to fish. We're not called to claim the title disciples or the title Christians. We're called to make disciples. That's it. This is not enough. And it starts with one. As we close today, I want you to take some time. Think about who the one person in your life is right now who you can go and share the love of Christ with. Maybe it's a brother or a sister. Maybe it's your parent, your children, a coworker, someone you go to school with. Maybe it's the guy you see at the convenience store every time you get gas. Who's the one person God is putting in your life right now you can go fish for? And fishing isn't complicated. You don't have to learn some grand way to go and to fish. We just tell them what Jesus did for us. Who is your one?